then they might end up being a, a leadership position and might cut a music program out of a school. That's today's guest, educator, author, and musicer Mary Cohen, giving us just one reason we want everyone to know that they are, in fact, a musician. Welcome to Music Ed Insights. I'm leadership trainer and former band director Alan Fire, here with composer and co-college music education program coordinator Steve Shanley. Each episode, Alan and I talk with national thought leaders in music education with practical insights for K-12 music educators. Steve, tell us about our guest. Mary Cohen is an associate professor of music education at the University of Iowa, where she researches music making and well-being, songwriting, and collaborative communities. She recently co-authored a book titled Music Making in U.S. Prisons, which we strongly encourage our listeners to check out. She's also an authority on the teachings of music education education philosopher Christopher Small, which is why we have asked her here today. Find Mary's full bio, show notes, and resources at musicedinsights.com. What was a high point for you in this interview, Alan? She reminds us to humanize everyone in ways big and small. A, a small thing I love, referring to people as people, not their voice part or instrument. I had a director who always called me tuba. Dr. Cohen would not do that. What about you, Steve? Agreed. Dr. Cohen was one of my professors in grad school, and to this day, I am grateful for how she encouraged me to think about the language I use when referring to people, musical performances, and something as seemingly innocent as sheet music. It's cool to be able to share this with our listeners. So much here, both grand and simple. Let's get to Mary Cohen. Mary Cohen, welcome to the program. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Alan. It's a joy to be here today. Well, we've asked you to help us learn a little bit more about the work of Christopher Small. But before we dig into specifics, let's start with this. Why should music teachers learn about Christopher Small and his ideas? What a great question. Well, I am so excited to talk about Christopher Small. Christopher Small really transformed how we think about the word music and the idea of music. He defined it as a verb and said the most important aspects of musicking are not only the, what we think of naturally of the sonic music making relationships, he also brought the social dimension of music making on the same par as the sonic dimension. So David Elliott also had musicking as a verb. What's the difference? So if you were to look really closely about how each of these thinkers consider the concept of music, that will help you understand the deeper differences between musicking by Eliot and musicking by Small. For example, David Eliot says that the nature of musicking is based on the nature of music, while Christopher Small would say that the social elements of music making are just as important as the sonic elements. For example, when we think about our career as music educators, we have a two-part term. We have music education and how a person understands which of those terms are more important and how they understand music education will impact their whole way and approach toward music making. If they think music is the most important thing, the sonic dimensions, how we create sound, that will create a different learning experience and pedagogical experience than someone who would place the education element as the primary element that would involve someone being super concerned about the people they're teaching. What are their backgrounds? What are the things that really make them excited to be human? And to what extent can a musical experience relate to their own personal and social identities? So full disclosure to Alan and our listeners, I had no idea who Christopher Small was until I was fortunate to take a class with Mary where we read uh, some of his ideas. And as you mentioned, Mary, this holistic idea where we take the social aspect into it, and it's just a much broader picture, thinking of it as a verb. And I'm wondering, why do more of us not know about him? Why was I in my late 30s before I heard about this? Why is this not mentioned alongside Orphan Could I? Well, um, and I, I want to share a little bit more about Small's concept of music in, in my answer. So Small also would say that the most important aspects of music making um, are, like I mentioned already, the social and the sonic together. He also would ask people who are music making, musicking, 
that when we're music making, there's a deep exploration, affirmation, and celebration of a sense of ideal relationships. That's really important. And Small would ask whose relationships are being celebrated. And there's a lot of power dynamics in the answer to that question. So if you were to really dig into small, I mean, he, it's really a paradigm shift with how traditional music learning occurs. Like, for example, traditional music theory, traditional music history is so sonic based. So Small's ideas really push the boundaries in new ways to how we consider what music making is. I think sometimes when there's such a, a paradigm shift in how we think about something that we've been doing so long in a field, that there could be a push against that. And that might be part of why there's been a delay. When I see other people read other people's concept, reading about musicking, sometimes they throw out the word without really understanding the deeper elements of his points, which include, number one, that music is not an object, but an activity. Even that first assumption of music not being an object, but an activity is quite contrary to how people think about music composition. It was when in graduate school for me when I stopped using the word music as a noun and not calling a piece of paper music. Music is an aural art. It's an experience that we have kinesthetically. We listen. It's an embodied art. So a piece of paper is not music. He also argues that all people are capable of musicking. In many of our school music making experiences, we don't really embrace that idea. When we have auditions, when we have the fact that this person can be involved and this person cannot be involved in a school music making thing. And I think that's extremely problematic for society and for people. One of the things you mentioned earlier was the relationships and whose relationships are we celebrating and affirming. So played out to a not ideal scenario. What does that look like when we are maybe not thinking about that in the right way in a school music program? Well, I don't want to say that there's a right way and a wrong way. There are all ways and just the outcomes of those ways can be inadvertently, we can cause harm. For example, if someone goes through a school system and they were told they can't sing, well, you know what Christopher Small would say? He would say that teacher should be sacked on the spot because it's our job as teachers to teach people to sing. And if a, if a person goes through a music program in a school and they're told that kind of a negative comment, then they might end up being in a leadership position and might cut a music program out of a school because they don't understand that everybody has the capacity to be a singer, everybody has the capacity to be a musician. Let me uh, ask a, a naive question for fun. Mm -hmm. So if musicking can also include just listening to and appreciating the music, Mm -hmm. and I'm at a average sized high school and I want to be in the band, but not play an instrument. I just want to music by watching the rehearsal, learning about the composer hmm. and watching all my friends play their instrument. Mm -hmm. Can I join band? What about creating some other kind of way of that student engaging in the experience? Maybe they want to do some kind of a writing reflection. That's one example. Maybe they want to learn more about the composers that are performing. Maybe they they want to do some kind of a visual art. I mean, is there a way to do some kind of interdisciplinary art experience where someone who doesn't want to perform an instrument in an ensemble, but still wants to be involved and connected? Maybe the student has an idea of how they could be involved in a creative way. Back to the first assumption that music is not an object, but it's an activity. This is something I changed the way I used language after working with you, and I also refer to sheet music as sheet music and not music. Why is that so important to Small or to you that music be viewed as an activity? What is the harm of it being mm -hmm. an object? Why yeah. is it an awful thing for a music teacher to say, could you please bring me that pile of music or I'm handing out music today? If we play that out to its worst case scenario, why should we care about that? I wouldn't say that there's harm. What I would say rather is to what extent are we really thinking about what we mean when we talk about music making? Every time we are music making, we're musicking Depending on the context, I mean, there's going to be a different experience we have because of our own relationship to the event. So I wouldn't say that it's a terrible thing someone keeps calling. Well, I really don't like it when people call 
pieces of paper, music, because it diminishes this amazing thing we do as musicians, which is we are engaging in sound together in real time and expressing something that means something to us. We have a lot of Christopher Small information and thoughts about singing, singing and songs. So what would be some considerations for our instrumental music teachers, for example, or what are some universal things that we can take that regardless of the type of music we're making, even if it does not involve speaking or text, that we can apply to a recorder ensemble or a guitar ensemble or a concert band? One of the things that he talks about is the language that we use in instrumental ensembles tend to place a higher power or priority on instruments than on the people. Mm -hmm. For example, first flute, second violin. Mm -hmm. What about the people playing those? Uh, is there a way in an instrumental music program a teacher could rearrange how they speak about the parts? Oh, they absolutely can. Okay, great. Alan's Sorry. already talked they, about it. They absolutely can. Yeah. Oh, no, it's one of my pet peeves mm. is uh, a, a, a conductor who I and a professor who I'm very loyal to to this day. She was a wonderful instructor, but had that old school habit of calling me tuba. You know, I'm Alan. Mm. I'm not tuba. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the tuba player. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was the only tuba player. Mm -hmm. Why keep calling me tuba and why not Alan? Mm -hmm. And if there are 12 tubas, you could say tuba players, people playing the tuba, yeah. the way that it, when you have talked about uh, some of the choral work you've done um, with incarcerated people. You didn't say you did that with prisoners. No, you did that with incarcerated people. So I, anyway, I, I yes, maybe that's where you're going. Maybe yeah. that's not where you're going. But that you is really awakened with that in me. It's a huge pet peeve of mine. Thank you, Alan. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Is are we centering the people in how we're talking about the people that we are facilitating our musical learning with? I think the other part he was talking about with language and power and priority is the fact that there are first, second. I mean, to what what does what is, how does a student understand that they are a second versus a first? Do they feel like they are judged with that, or do they have some kind of an awareness of you know, this is just like a big, uh, th more than three dimensional puzzle, and each person has a really important role in e every whatever part they're playing? I don't know enough about um, the best affirming pedagogy and language choice for instrumental ensembles. Alan, do you have a thought on that? Well, and before he digs in, I totally agree with this. I'm playing the devil's advocate as I think it's the inadvertent use of the language. It's much easier to just say second clarinets. Don't forget the F sharp in that measure as opposed to some sort of desire by the teacher to dehumanize the students playing the second clarinet. So I think it's a convenience that has arisen that might have had an unintended consequence. So when I'm looking for our listeners to have an alternative, and that's why I said to Alan, is that, isn't that maybe a little bit cumbersome? Like, is there an easier way to do that? If there's one tuba player and it's Alan, that's very easy. But if it's a large group of 12 people who are playing the second clarinet part, I'm wondering, because I totally agree, and I want to offer an easier solution. Or we lay the groundwork from whatever choir starts, orchestra starts, band starts, that there's no stigma associated with playing the third clarinet part. I think that that can be done. I'd also say, so what if it's a little more cumbersome? Sometimes when a teacher does something that's a little cumbersome, it sends the message, I care enough about my language that I'm going to use five words instead of one. Mm -hmm. I care enough about dignifying the individual. And if mm -hmm. some student ever says, because I'm telling you, a student would say, why do you keep saying the people playing the second clarinet part instead of you second clarinets or second clarinets? Mm -hmm. And then that gives the teacher an opportunity to say, ah, oh, that's an important part of musicking mm -hmm. is you're not second clarinets. You're not even mm -hmm. clarinets. You're the people mm -hmm. playing that part. Another thing you could do, though, if you really want to stay away from saying second clarinets or the people playing the second part, you could gesture toward them and say, those of you here in the second and third row who have the F sharp at the beginning of the measure, please circle that accidental. 
or whatever yeah, it is that we're trying to convey. It's still a person first language. Person first language, right. yeah. And maybe even add a little sparkle, a little affirmation like, you amazing people. I find that very warm hearted when I'm receiving that kind of a energetic introduction to who I am as a person. Let's talk a little bit about the role of the audience. And for us, maybe programming music or or picking music for students to learn that ultimately is going to be performed for an audience. Mm -hmm. Do you think if the audience plays a role in the whole musicking process, is it our responsibility to think about the audience and how they are going to respond to our music, whether it is the length of the program, uh, the variety in the program, any ideas how small might weigh in on our responsibility to a potential audience? Or is it simply we do what's best for us as musicians and the audience is going to experience it however they experience it? I'm going to be answering this from my own experience in programming concerts, as well as the things that I've been informed in from reading and studying Christopher Small. And yes, audience absolutely should be central in our thinking when we're planning something. So for example, something as simple as key center, you probably all do this already where you go notice what key every piece is in and make sure that it goes together, whether it maybe is a similar sounding key or just changing from like C to A minor or something. So there's like an aural comfort from the listener's standpoint to the language, the, the tempo, you know, what, how it's starting. It's a program starting out with something that's, that's going to capture people's excitement and awareness and interest. What is the purpose of a concert? I mean, hopefully every concert has something that's connected to the lives of the community. So the people in the community can feel engaged with what's going on in the music making. Maybe there's a chance to have like the musical learning exchange where there's a little facilitation of something related to the topic where people would share briefly their their experiences of the topic that's being like the theme of the concert, for example. Another way to be, engage the audience is to have the students in the program to share in advance with their family members and anybody they're planning to invite to the concert in advance, here's what we're going to be doing in this concert and invite you to think in advance about this concept of maybe it's respect or something that they're focusing on in the concert. Would there be a chance for the members of the school ensemble to give brief introductions that are that are written by themselves, the, you know, the, the participants of the, the students in the program writing and then sharing that with a group? Or maybe there could be some kind of a collaborative thing done between the family members that would be brought in as part of the program. What I mean by that is the themes respect, for example, to what extent are they exploring that within their own families? Is there something that's meaningful to them? Whatever the theme might be, and then they could bring that in and have that be more of a full community engaging experience. So the audience is actually part of the performance in some way, shape, or form. I mean, we can also think of our own experiences as audience members and what are those experiences that really felt like they touched our hearts and where where we felt like we had a connection. And what's so special about a school music program is if you do have family members in the audience, wow, you already have this beautiful community of people together that have a blood relationship. To what extent could there be a new way of creating more connections among the people there in the audience. Here's another simple thing I always do at vocal concerts is teach the fact that singing is a learned skill. And if someone feels like they can't sing, they just haven't learned yet. And if someone tells has told them that they can't sing, that means that person doesn't know that singing is a learned skill. Even if no one has explicitly said, oh, your singing voice is bad, I do feel like the current culture with America's Got Talent, American Idol, mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. that a lot of people, even if they never hear that directly said to them, they make that decision on their own. Just mm -hmm. like I have made the decision on my own without anyone ever needing to tell me that I'm not a very good golfer. Mm -hmm. And so I would say it's our responsibility to overcorrect and try and go out of our way to those people who maybe were never told, no, you can't sing, to find them or create an atmosphere 
that overcorrects and is welcoming and says, no, we really think everybody can do this. Any other ideas you have for things that instrumental music teachers, band and orchestra teachers, someone teaching a guitar class might be maybe missing the boat on that they could use to implement some of Small's teachings into either their classroom or just the way they think about designing their classroom? I do want to share one thing that I learned recently. Um, West Liberty School District in Iowa, their elementary music programs are called the essentials not the specials. And I think that is brilliant. And I hope more K-12 teachers will use terms that align with how vital it is that as humans, we are music makers. They're essential parts of being human and really um, be bold about that. Be really bold and and be bold in an inclusive way <laughs> that allows the every person in the school, maybe more secondary general music programming, yeah. more opportunities for people that have never played an instrument to feel comfortable, feel capable of learning. We're, we are teachers. Our job is to teach all of the people interested in music making how to be a musician. And I would think there could be some very creative things that might happen at school assemblies maybe where you're inviting everyone to do some kind of body percussion or some other kind of a whole school music making. And also, hey, instrumental students and ensembles can sing as well. Ideally, our listeners would read everything by and about Christopher Small, like you did, but probably not possible. So if they're going to do just a little bit, like where, yeah. where should they dip their toe into the Christopher Small pool? One great thing for anybody to read is the Christopher Small Reader. It's edited by Robert Walser, who, by the way, Robert Walser and his partner, Susan McClary, were the two people that brought Christopher Small's writing back to life. Robert took several of Small's writing and put it together in this Christopher Small Reader, and it ends with a brilliant, short, short essay called Pelicans, which I think might have been one of his very last things he ever wrote. And there's this beautiful, it's just a simple little um three-page essay about pelicans and the relationships of pelicans flying and um, beauty. And he references Gregory Bateson. He says at the end of this essay, if, as Bateson suggests, emotions are the representation and consciousness of relationships, then perhaps the sensation of beauty is the representation of consciousness of right or ideal relationships as imagined by the perceiver. The other thing I want to say really quick about reading, though, is the way he wrote Music King is you could read every other chapter and, and get an idea of he, he does like an ethnographic examination of a Western Symphony Orchestra concert and what it's like. So you could read every other chapter to get that part and then the, those other chapters to dig into his theories. And I'll point out also for our listeners, if you search Christopher Small, Musicking with a K, you'll likely see Mary's dissertation on the first page. And thanks to her alma mater's generous publishing rules, it is not behind any sort of paywall. So I think anyone can look at that and see some nice things that Mary wrote in there. Thank you. And the actual theory that I write of choral singing pedagogy in prison context can be applied in any choral singing pedagogy and probably it could be applied to instrumental programming as well. And a lot of my research through my career has been testing this theory, which basically says, if facilitated effectively, that's the big if, choral singing has the potential for measurable personal and social growth. All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, but can you stick around for our lightning round on five other questions? Sure. Okay. What is your favorite restaurant in Iowa City, Iowa? Baroncini's. Mmm. I'm guessing Italian food? Yes, it is. It's Italian. It's phenomenal. Highly recommend Baroncini's. Jean-Luc Baroncini. He's from Northern Italy, the chef, the owner. How about a piece of music, a composer, or a performer that you wish more people knew about? I just tell you, I used to really, really enjoy all of the original songs that we created with the Oakdale Choir. They have such deep meanings to me. So I would say any of the original songs, and we did create 150 original songs. Choir sings 75 of those. How about a favorite film or TV series you've been enjoying? That's a great question because I have so many I like, but we were chatting earlier in our conversation. It reminded me of that powerful series dope sick it's not a light one 
by any means, but boy, that's something that really helps us understand issues of substance abuse and the Oxycontin abuse. How about your most memorable live music performance? Well, I'll just mention the very last Oakdale concert. The theme was Remember, Be Love. And I think that message, we had no idea that was the last time this choir would ever rehearse, December of 2019. But that theme, Remember, Be Love, with the line, Every Wrong is the Reason to Forgive. It's amazing that that's what was our last concert. So we had a powerful experience there. And this might lead nicely into my last question. Can you tell us a little bit about your most recent book, which I see is receiving some very rave reviews? Thank you. Yeah, well, that line, Every Wrong is a Reason to Forgive, the musical notation to that line is on the front cover of the book. And if you look through the book at the beginning of every chapter, that musical notation is there. So that theme of forgiveness is woven through the whole book. A big shout out to my co-author, Stuart Paul Duncan. So in the book we have, it's the first comprehensive book that examines history and contemporary practices of music making in prisons. And we argue against, um, we argue, we provide in the introductory chapter a thorough explanation of the prison industrial complex. There's a lot of misunderstandings of what that is. There's also a lot of misunderstandings of what it means to, when we talk about abolishing prisons, it's all about um, thinking in new ways for actually dealing with the social problems that are prevalent in society, whether those problems relate to substance abuse, domestic abuse, a variety of issues. And a lot of the work in the book is influenced by Christopher Small's concept of musicking. Um, and there's a chapter on instrumental music making, on choral singing, on songwriting, and on pedagogy. So there's a phenomenal new book out there called Empowering Song that I encourage a lot of people to, I just encourage every listener to look, whether you're a vocalist or or an instrumentalist. Empowering Song is a brilliant, Andre de Quadros and Emily Amarine wrote that book. Now, I know you told me to tell you about my book, but <laughs> we talk about their book in the last chapter. Well, actually, their book wasn't done when we finished our book but it came out shortly after our book. And um, it really, he, they, they take an approach with um, Augusto Boal's Theater of the Oppressed and really empower the singers by allowing their stories to be a central part of the music making. Mary Cohen, I can't believe we haven't met before today, but I'm really glad that we have corrected that situation. This has been a treat. Thank you so much for coming and sharing this really important and impactful stuff. You're welcome, Alan. It's been a joy. Thank you so much for the invitation to talk about Christopher Small. I think his ideas are just resonate and will continue to resonate with musicians, with teachers, with society. You've been listening to Music Ed Insights. Please support this podcast by subscribing, rating, and reviewing it. Reach out to us on our Facebook page, Music Ed Insights, or via Twitter at Music Ed Insights. Our website is also the place to find program notes, links, and a one-page download of this episode's key takeaways. That's musicedinsights.com. This podcast is sponsored and supported by The Normal Design, helping normal companies and normal people create memorable, meaningful, and professional designs and branding. Learn more at thenormaldesign.com. Also, Winterset Websites, website design and maintenance, wintersetwebsites.com. Group Dynamic, a leading provider of youth leadership workshops. Allen works with dozens of schools each year to help develop their leaders. Learn more at groupdynamic.net slash youth hyphen leadership. Or you could email me at allen at groupdynamic.net. Also sponsored by the Co College Music Education Program, they've got a website too. Just click on the link at our website or email me at shamley at coe.edu. New episodes generally drop every two weeks on Monday. Get current, stay relevant, music ed insights.